right, good evening everyone and thanks for joining us and welcome to the uh, the first WPTV First Alert Weather Spotters team. I know we have a great group. I see you all on uh, Zoom. So we, uh, we have a couple of things that we want to uh, just get out of the way quickly. Make sure your microphone is muted so that we don't hear people talking over each other. We're going to have a, a Q&A coming up uh, near after we show some of the uh, training presentation. And uh, you want to click on the speaker view option in Zoom so that you're able to see the training as it's going on. We have uh, all of our First Alert meteorologists have put together uh, the, the explanations and some training on, you know, the damaging winds and tornadoes and severe thunderstorms and flooding conditions uh, so that uh, you, you know what to look for uh, when you're out there to, uh, helping us, you know, watch the weather around South Florida. And there are going to be a lot of questions, I suspect. So uh, we're going to, uh, you know, hold the questions off until we get through the uh, training part, which I suspect will last about 15 to 20 minutes. So put your questions in the Zoom chat. We have someone monitoring the chat and we'll be able to get to those at the end of the presentation. I think a lot of the questions will come up as the, uh, the, the, the stories are told, like on flooding and on you know, the damaging winds. So uh, you can type them in right away and then uh, one of our producers will pass them along to uh, James and I. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it's gonna be exciting. I, I suspect this is gonna last about 30, maybe 35 minutes. We're gonna go through some of the training and then we have a, a special guest tonight, a professional storm chaser who is going to be talking a little bit about what he does. I've known him for 25 years now. He's a, a local, uh, local guy who's with us and I think he has some video and some uh, photos to also show us. All right, so we're going to start off, uh, you know, we're in the studio here at uh, WPTV. I'm going to start off with James Whelan, who joins us. Exciting time for us, isn't it, James? We're going to be doing this uh, very first, uh, you know, uh, training for weather spotters. And these are really the ears and the eyes on the ground that will really help us out during severe weather coverage. Yeah, always great to have you all out there taking pictures for us, getting video when it's safe to do that. And uh, we just love you that you're joining this too. And hopefully uh, we'll stick around here and we're going to gain momentum and get a bunch of other people to join up too to be our eyes and ears out in the field. First, I want to talk about straight line winds. Now, this is the most common thing that we're going to see in our area here. Tornadoes, those are there too, but these are just the straight line winds. We're going to save the tornado top for John Gerard. He's coming up in just a minute. So first we'll talk a little about about how this forms. So we have a big storm forming here, right? You have the, the strong winds coming up the rising air. That's what's creating the storm. It's called an updraft. So these updrafts are pulling air into the storm and the storm is getting taller and taller here with these uh, strong updrafts. And as we go through time here, eventually those updrafts, Steve, maybe if we can click this here, these, there we go. These updrafts cool and coming out of that, a big burst of air pushes down, a downburst we call it. And obviously if a plane is below that, that's when you feel, we've all felt it, we've all been in a plane when all of a sudden it drops like a thousand feet or so. That may be due to a downburst and it's very dangerous for planes that are obviously coming in for landing here. And there's a couple different types of these downbursts. We have micro versus macro. Micro, as you can imagine, is just smaller. If it's two and a half miles wide or smaller, it's a micro burst. If it's two and a half miles or greater than two and a half miles, then it would be a macro burst and it will actually uh, affect way more people greater than two and a half miles. And these things can get rather large too. Now for us, we're probably more likely to see the micro ones here, but can't rule out, of course, a bigger one coming on down. Now, what does it look like? Well, actually these is what you're gonna see uh, as you go through, here we go, here's a picture, the shelf cloud. So that storm, that cooler air in the core of the storm, pushing down out of the storm and then pushing straight horizontal to the land, that will cause rising motion and it will look like this, a scary dark cloud or a shelf cloud moving towards the coast. Now behind this will be very gusty winds, damaging winds, 58 mile per hour or higher means that it's a severe thunderstorm and we get a, quite a cooling behind this too. These are just a few that I've shot here at the beaches. I think this one was Fort Pierce, uh, actually not too long ago, it's in June. 
and uh, a couple of them here. So this is what it looks like, that air that's pushing down out of the cloud, then pushing straight forward, and that can cause a lot of damage too. So what, how do we estimate this type of wind here? So we have this little scale here. This comes from the National Weather Service uh, in Miami, and uh, they also have a storm spotter program there. And you see the large branches, fronds in motion. When you see it's really, really blowing back and forth here, that's up to 30 miles per hour. When you start seeing things falling or breaking off, that's when we're getting into almost a severe threat. That's 40, 54 mile per hour winds. Then once you get above that, then we're in severe thunderstorm territory. 58 plus is a severe thunderstorm, and that's when you start seeing damage, trees fall over, TV antennas, uh, some of the surfaces of roofs may start to peel off at 72 miles per hour or so. And once you get into the hundreds, of course, you get major uh, destruction here where some homes will be destroyed, trailer homes will be destroyed, some weak buildings may push in the windows and that kind of thing. So this is a, a good a guide here to what we're dealing at with here as you look out. And if you can safely take those pictures like these here, before the storm comes, and usually this is accompanied by a lot of lightning out there too, that's what we want you guys to do. Steve? I love it, James. Love it. That's exactly what we want uh, you guys, uh, and I think we have almost 50 people on our Zoom meeting tonight. That's what we want you to do. We, you want, we want you to be the eyes out there up and down the coastline from Boca and Southern Palm Beach County all the way up through Indian River County, back through Okeechobee County, St. Lucie and Martin, of course, Palm Beach County, and just, um, you know, watching the weather for us. And as James just showed you with some of the, uh, the, the photos, I mean, those are actual photos of storms that have rolled through. I mean, it's amazing here in South Florida with all the weather that we get here. I mean, we get almost everything. Uh, we even had some snow back in 1977. Uh, now, tied to James, oh, before, before I get into uh, our next uh, presenter, I want to show you this. This is, uh, I just, was just handed this. This is a magnet, this is a car magnet, and this uh, we're going to be sending eventually this out to everyone uh, who is uh, participating tonight. So you can put that on your car. It says official member of the First Alert weather spotters. I love it. All right, I think this is the only one that exists right now, but we'll be sending those out. All right, so tied to what James was talking about and the damaging winds and, uh, you know, the downburst, uh, also severe thunderstorms. And uh, Steve Villanueva, uh, I'm going to bring him in, and he's going to talk a little bit about severe thunderstorms and, and the thunderstorms in general and what you should be looking for. Thunderstorms and lightning. So first we're going to talk about how thunderstorms form. Basically, you need air to go up into the atmosphere. And here in South Florida, that happens very easily because we always have a lot of moisture in place because we're a peninsula. And we also have all of that hot sun during the summer months, which heats the ground. And then eventually that starts to rise into the atmosphere. And as the storms rise, they get bigger and bigger. And sometimes they can go up to anywhere about 30,000 feet or higher. And when you get those storms that go higher than that, they could be on the strong side. Now, what happens when you get lightning? Basically, there are charged particles within the thunderstorms. You have positive and negative particles. Now, the positives tend to go to the top of the thunderstorms. Then on the bottom, you have the negative ones, and then you have the positive on the ground. So the trees and the ground itself. And that's what happens when the lightning starts to come on down. So they start to shoot within the thunderstorm and then it shoots down towards the ground. And in fact, it actually begins on the ground. It's called a step leader. And the lightning bolt actually creates it on the ground and then shoots up, at least the light does. So that's something interesting. And most of the lightning strikes actually go towards higher ground, towards the trees and towards buildings and structures and things like that. Positive strikes can occur, can occur from the storm anvil, and usually those are the deadliest ones. You can see here's the storm anvil. You can see the upper level winds blowing the top of the thunderstorms away from the actual storm. That's the anvil, and that's where some of the lightning strikes come all the way down, and those can lead to some fatalities. Now, here are some lightning facts. Lightning can strike miles away from the parent storm. So when thunder roars, it definitely go indoors. You can always count when you hear uh, the lightning and you can count in five seconds. That means that it's about a mile away. So here's some safety tips, things you want to avoid during a lightning storm. You certainly want to avoid water because uh, 
once the lightning hits the water, it can travel through the water. You certainly want to avoid metal as well. Now, if you're out in an open field, you definitely don't want to hide under a tree because the lightning strikes can hit the tree and that is very dangerous. The lightning can also hit the metal bleachers. And if you're in the middle of the field, that could be a uh, pretty dangerous as well. So you just want to kind of curl yourself up into a little ball and uh, try to stay away from trees and metal objects. All right, so here we go. Lightning is hotter than the surface of the sun. In fact, it can be about 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very, very hot. That's one of the reasons why it's so dangerous and you certainly want to avoid lightning strikes at all costs. Now here in South Florida, we have a ton of lightning strikes annually. In fact, we are in the top 10, if not number one, with all of the lightning strikes that we have. It's very common in the state of Florida. Remember, we're a peninsula, so we get a lot of sunshine here during the summer months, and that tends to lead to rising air, and then the winds start to come in from both sides, from the Atlantic, from the Gulf, and where they collide, you get the thunderstorms that go up in the atmosphere, and then with all of that moisture rising, and all depending on how high they go, you do get the thunderstorms, and that's why we pick up so many in the way of thunderstorms and lightning strikes here in South Florida. All right, thank you, V. And uh, as he mentioned, we want you to be safe out there. So, you know, taking these safety tips, you, you know, you hear thunder, you want to be in a safe location. Uh, it, we, obviously, we get a lot of thunderstorms here. Some of them are strong and severe and uh, with gusty winds and damaging winds. You know, we, we want you to, uh, you know, uh, send in your videos and your reports and your photos. Uh, you know, when we get uh, hurricanes coming and uh, any kind of severe weather, or even dramatic sunset shots, uh, but we want you to be safe at the same time. So that's why we're passing along these safety tips. You know, something that's kind of tied to, or definitely tied to severe thunderstorms would be hail. And we do, even though it's 90, 95 out there during the day, you think hail, how, how could that happen? But it does. And uh, Katia Hall kind of breaks down some of the, um, the, the hail situations that we get into here in South Florida. Thank you so much for joining us on this WPTV First Alert Weather Spotters training. I'm meteorologist Katya Hall, and we're going to be talking about hail today. What the hail is hail anyways? Hail is a form of precipitation consisting of solid ice that forms inside thunderstorm updrafts. So within a thunderstorm, you have winds going up the cloud, known as an updraft, winds going down the cloud, known as a downdraft. And when there's a strong updraft, raindrops are forced to go up into the cloud where temperatures can reach below freezing, causing these rain droplets to turn into ice. The ice piece travels down the cloud via the downdraft. The the updraft can grab hold of the particle, sending it back up into the cloud where the ice crystal can gain another layer. This up and down cycle continues until the piece of ice is too heavy and gravity pulls it down towards the ground. Oftentimes people can mistake grapple for hail or hail for grapple, and it's two different forms of precipitation here. Grapple actually starts off as a snowflake. It falls through a layer of super cooled water droplets or water that's essentially below freezing, but still in its liquid form. The droplets freeze or rhyme, as we'd like to say, onto the snowflakes, and the end result are tiny white pellets that resemble small hail. Unlike hail, though, they are soft and crushable. So here's the difference between hail versus grapple. Again, hail is precipitation in the form of solid ice, and it looks like this, hard pieces of ice. A way to differentiate between the two is hail often makes a sound when it hits the ground. Grapple does not. Grapple, small, soft ice pellets formed when supercooled water droplets condense onto snowflakes. And again, they're soft and brittle. They kind of look like dip in dots or styrofoam balls. Depending on how strong the updraft is will depend on just how big hail can get. So pea size hail, about a quarter inch size, dime size hail, up to three quarters of an inch. Anything above an inch is considered severe. While we see a whole lot of thunderstorms here in Florida, we don't typically see a whole lot of hail, and that's because we have something called that high freezing level. So hail may start off in the cloud, but usually it melts before it hits the ground. However, places like Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, which is considered hail alley, they have a low freezing level. So hail is able to remain intact 
as it hits the ground. Here's how to take a picture picture of hail. Make sure to take a picture of hail with another object like a ruler or a baseball. This gives us kind of a frame of reference to the size of hail. Do not use marbles since marbles come in different sizes. Ah, oh, yes, stole my line, Katya. That's exactly right. Uh, we, when we get uh, reports from viewers and uh, folks on social media about the size of hail, and they'll say, oh, well, it's marble size. Well, if you were a kid and you play marbles, you know, marbles come in all different sizes. So it's better to use actual objects like uh, that are set in stone, the size like dime or nickel size or quarter size. Uh, or golf ball size hail. It, uh, it, it's great because we pass along all the information that you're going to provide us when you're uh, you know, out there reporting the weather for us. It, we're going to pass this along to the weather service either in Melbourne or in Miami. And they, they always want to know the exact, for hail the exact time and the size of it because that uh, determines whether they're going to issue a severe weather warning or um, maybe just a, 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 a heads up for strong thunderstorms. So good information there. Thank you, Katia. All right, um, from hail to tornadoes, John Gerard, who actually did one of these weather spotter programs in the Midwest just a couple of years ago. He's going to talk a little bit about tornadoes and what we see here in South Florida. I want to talk to you a little bit about tornadoes. It's not something that really we think about a whole lot in Florida, but we should because we get a lot of them here. In fact, uh, the most tornadoes since 1980 state by state. Well, we're ranked number three. That's right. I mean, when you think about states like Texas and Kansas, you know, those are the ones you think about, uh, you know, tornadoes and Oklahoma and Nebraska. When people think of Florida, they tend to think of hurricanes, floods, hail. You know, high winds, lightning, things like that. But uh, tornadoes, we rank number three, so that might have caught you a little bit by surprise. Although you're weather spotters, you're probably not surprised because you're like me, you love weather, right? So you might have known that. But a lot of folks didn't really uh, appreciate the fact that Florida is number three. Now, fortunately, we don't get those big, you know, EF4, EF5 tornadoes like they have out in the Plain States in Tornado Alley, which makes it kind of difficult. This is why we need you because a lot of times we see what we see on radar, and of course we have our own live Doppler radar, and we also have Viper radar, which with all the algorithms built into that, allows us to see things that the traditional radar doesn't really see. This was a, a system that produced a tornado a couple of months ago, and you notice how you know we just had a big area of heavy rain and lightning on the radar, and then it just uh, kind of took on a bit of a hook echo there. So these are the things that we can see here at the TV station, but you are the boots on the ground. You know, just because we see that does not necessarily mean there's a tornado on the ground just because we have indications of that from the radar, you know, aloft. For example, this was a funnel cloud around Port St. Lucie about a month ago or so. And uh, here's another view of that uh, you can see right there. Uh, by the way, you never want to take pictures when you're driving. If you're a passenger, that's fine, but don't ever do that while you're driving. Always take your picture safely and never while you're driving a vehicle. But uh, again, your, where your help comes into play here is that you can let us know if that's actually touching down. The radar indicates a funnel, uh, but it does not indicate that it's necessarily on the ground. Also, I want to let you know that while the peak month for tornadoes across the country is May, we still have reports of tornadoes every single month of the year. Unfortunately for us, they tend to be in the minor to moderate EF0 or EF1 categories, but uh, the small ones are the ones that sometimes slip on by, and we need your help uh, verifying those. So a watch means conditions are favorable, so have a plan. A warning means it's likely, and you need to take action. And one of the ways that we're going to have a little fun here is uh, to describe the watch and the warning. Say you have like all these ingredients for a taco, right? Doesn't mean there's actually a taco. You got to put them all together. Once it comes together, okay, you see the taco right there. The taco watch and taco warning, right? You got to have a little fun. Weather has to be fun once in a while, right? <laughs> all right, thanks, John. I'm hungry now. Uh, and uh, John, uh, you know, talked about that Palm Beach Gardens tornado a couple of months ago. I was here that night covering that. Now there were I believe two or three tornado warnings. The uh, that that cell tracked right down PGA Boulevard from the Turnpike in toward uh, 95 and around Burns Road. And you know we were on air for you know nonstop. As I suspect for about an hour covering it. There were tornado warnings, but there, we didn't get any confirmed reports of a tornado on the ground. It turned out there there was a tornado touchdown, and especially around Palm Beach Gardens High School. And uh, that's. 
that's why we really want you to be involved with this weather spotter program. If you're in the gardens or you're in Fort Pierce or Vero or Boker or wherever around the lake, uh, we want you to report what you're seeing. Uh, call us, we'll put you on air, we'll uh, share your videos and your uh, photos too. So that uh, Palm Beach Gardens tornado situation was a, a good example of what we can run into here uh, with uh, tornado warnings. The radar sees something, but that does not mean that there's a tornado actually touching the ground. All right, um, along with severe weather, of course, we have flooding and Kate Wenzel, I think a lot of you talked to her as we uh, kicked this uh, off uh, just a few minutes ago. She's going to talk a little bit about uh, flooding and uh, flooding situations that we see here. Hi everybody, I'm First Alert Meteorologist Kate Wenzel and thank you so much for being part of our Weather Spotters program. We're really excited about this and you are going to be a very important tool when we're trying to cover uh, severe weather events. So I'm going to talk about flash flood safety. Uh, flooding is very dangerous. In fact, flooding one of the most dangerous weather events since 2015. More than 100 people have died annually from floods and most fatalities happen when people try to drive right through flooded waters water is never a good idea. So we like to say turn around, don't drown because it doesn't take a whole lot of water to sweep you off your feet and uh, never allow children to play in or around flowing water. The difference between a flash flood emergency. This is exceedingly rare when a severe threat to human life and catastrophic damage from a flash flood will happen soon. A warning is issued when dangerous but not catastrophic flash flood is happening or will happen soon. So that's the difference between an emergency and a warning. Now let's talk about some differences between major flooding, moderate flooding and minor flooding. Major flooding, we're talking about extensive inundation of structures and roads along with significant evacuations of people and or property to higher elevations. Moderate flooding is some inundation of structures and roads and minor flooding is minimal or no property damage, but possibly a threat to the public with uh, flooded roads. Now it's hard to see flooding during the daytime. It's almost impossible to see at nighttime. And this just illustrates that you don't need a lot of water to really cause some problems. 12 inches of fast moving water can carry away a small car. 18 to 24 inches of fast moving water can carry away most large SUVs, vans and trucks. And it only takes six inches of fast moving water to knock you over and perhaps carry you downstream, which would be really bad. Do you want to stay out of flood waters, uh, play in the pool, not flood waters? Because there's all types of things in those waters that you don't know could be animals, insects, chemicals or sewage and power lines. And I want to leave you with this image. Uh, six feet of water on this road. This guy in this truck, he's trying to drive through it. Best case scenario, he might have to buy a new truck, but the worst case scenario, he's not going to make it home to see his family. All right, and let's talk about those uh, best practices for taking photos and videos. Horizontal pictures and video, they are preferred. However, we'll accept the horizontal and vertical uh, photos. Uh, we've been using them in the past. We just have to put borders or curtains on each side. Make sure that you have a safe, unobstructed view. And uh, if you're taking video, use a steady hand uh, and uh, try to keep uh, you know, your video uh, uh, down to uh, uh, in sometimes uh, 20 or 30 seconds and that that's well, I would say 30 seconds at least because then we can use it on air uh, easier and uh, it's really easy to share your photos and videos with us. If you have not done so already, you can upload them straight to the WPTV First Alert Weather Spotters Facebook group that you have all joined or you can email us at you report at WPTV.com. Keep in mind with uh, whichever option you decide to go with. Don't forget to include your name and location and uh, let us know what you're seeing out there. All right, I want to give you some examples of what we've um, uh, received from viewers in the past. This was a couple of months ago. This was actually June 6. This was uh, the uh, tornado that moved through Lakewood Park and into the Fort Pierce area. And this is video that we got in very quickly from a weather spotter in this area. And it was in, in just invaluable. And it, when we, we received this, we send that information along to the National Weather Service 
very quickly so that they can also cover it. And th they have a confirmed tornado on the ground at this point, rather than something that's just being indicated on the radar as a possible tornado. Another view of what appears to be a funnel cloud from that day. This was sent in by uh, Kristen Wilkinson of Fort Pierce. And you can see a big uh, line of storm that'll flash of lightning there. Uh, Steve Campbell sent this in a Stewart Yacht Club, and this was at the height of a severe weather we saw on June 6. It was a wild storm. We had it was a one-two punch. It moved from St. Lucie County, and then additional storms formed in Martin County with large, large hail. It was a wild day. Uh, video sent in uh, back in April. Uh, the, with the Palm Beach Gardens uh, Community High School. This was that tornado, that uh, short-lived tornado that rolled right down uh, PGA Boulevard and touched down at the, uh, the high school. I believe there was about an 80 mile an hour wind uh, because there was a weather sensor at the high school that recorded it. Another video from that same day that Karen G uh, from Palm Beach Gardens and uh, that is of uh, that tornado that touched. And you can't tell if it's a tornado or just a funnel cloud at this point, but your, as John said, uh, our boots on the ground, and you'll be able to give us um, the additional information uh, when uh, when you see this stuff and when you're tracking this stuff for us. And we're going to move on to the Q and A portion. So this will just take a second. We have to jump a couple of hoops here. James is going to join me, and we're also uh, okay. We want to turn on our video here. We have a special guest too. So let's let's start this. Just nod your head. Can everyone see us and hear and us. hear us? All right. Nice job, we you did it. Okay. All right, so uh, what are we gonna do now? I think we're gonna introduce Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Jeff, thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us tonight. Jeff and I, and, and James, uh, we worked together for many years. Uh, Jeff, the local professional storm chaser, uh, has uh, it, you know covered, I mean, a multitude of hurricanes and severe we've done tornado alley um and you know, he's just been invaluable so i'm wanna... always great content too you got to follow him on instagram yeah, I mean, yeah just great great uh great everything pictures video and i and he can talk about it but i believe he's uh because I, I went to his website yesterday and i think he's doing some editing on it but jeff i want to bring you in to, and talk a little bit about storm chasing and how you cover storms Oh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Steve, James, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Is it coming through? Oh, I can hear it. Yes, Jeff. Okay. All right. We're good to go? Sounds good, yeah. Okay. Hey, okay. So, hey, Steve, James, everybody. Uh, name is Jeff Gammons, and uh, I've been chasing storms here from Florida to the Plains. Wow, almost 30 years now. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been in probably about three dozen hurricanes going back to, uh, wow, the late 19, uh, mid 1990s. And, uh, my love for storms actually started here in Florida. I grew up, I was born and raised in Broward County, Florida, and I was the type of person that was a little upset when storms would go or miss my house when I was a teenager. And, uh, once I was able to drive, in the early 90s, uh, that's when I started chasing the storms. <laughs> we can see some of your video, I believe. We, well, it's back to us now, but uh, Jeff, it, uh, I remember early on, um, and Francis and Jean, I mm -hmm. know you, uh, you've made, I mean, you've made professional videos of those storms as you've covered them. Any, any advice, especially with hurricanes and storm surge, have you ever been in a situation where you, you felt like you might, that you might, I mean, you always want an exit location. You want an escape route, right? When you cover some of this stuff. Yeah, exactly. So usually when we chase hurricanes, if it's a category one or two, I, I will be solo a lot of the times, but if we're in more of a major situation, say a char hurricane, Charlie, Katrina, Michael, uh, Laura, you know, anything that's a cat three to four, I always chase with a group. Um, we have a couple of guys, uh, Jim Edge, Jeff Wachowski, and uh, we always will get to a target area and scout the location, not only um, for where we would like to set up for structures for filming and documenting the storm, but also where we're gonna retreat to if we have to with storm surge or wind, because you run from water and you hide from wind. And as many hurricanes that I've been in, it's always the water that pins me down somewhere. So. Uh, I had some really close calls in Katrina in 2005 at the Mississippi Coliseum where I had 28 foot storm surge 
locked me into my uh, building for about 14 hours till the water receded. Um, so that was that was pretty pretty intense storm. You have I know you you are storm chasing. You have a lot of technology in your car. Besides, well, I've seen it and. I know you always have the latest gadgets. That, any any advice you would give to our storm spotters? Anything? Any technology that you see right now that you really like? Maybe, maybe it's just you know the latest iPhone, or maybe it's a gimbal to keep the image stable. Absolutely, you can if, if you want a gimbal. I mean, you can gimbals for your phone, but even an iPhone and Android, they have their own built-in stabilization these days that are really good. Yeah, so the, the key is the ones do, don't they? Yeah. So the key is if you're going to be filming and documenting storms with your phone. You know, try to have two or three points of contact with your phone to keep it stable and smooth. Um, and then and then when you do point it, you know, when you're covering a storm, hold that shot for about 10 to 15 seconds be, instead of just whipping it back and forth. I know you get into the adrenaline with a really intense storm um, and do it safely, too, because you don't want to get caught with the lightning here and lightning lightning. I love storms and I love to document them, but I'm still to this day afraid of lightning. So I respect it. I've had some close calls. And, uh, and I shoot a lot of time lapses with lightning, but uh, you have to be very careful out there. Yeah. And before I, I don't, I don't want to forget this. Uh, I know, I, I think it looks like you're working on your website right now, but you were on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I know you, I mean, you, you put, you post some just incredible photos and videos. So everyone, um, if you're on Instagram or are you still on Facebook, I suspect too. Yeah. Jeff? Yes. And, and yeah, just you can probably just search storm visuals. Yeah, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Storm Visuals, or um, or Facebook, or Twitter. That's all usually under uh, Storm Visuals. Uh, my website, yeah, it's getting revamped because uh, I was uploading stuff for the new hurricane. Hopefully, uh, I have it ready in time before we get too active with the tropics here at the end of August going into September. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, you're 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 like the. Uh, you're the guy that we're tra trying to train everyone to, to be, and uh, you've been doing it for decades now, and you've been a, a massive help to us. If there's anything that's popped up in the last few years, yeah, I'll, I'll text Jeff, and I'll be like, hey, <laughs> were you chasing this? Did you see this? And he's always fantastic with uh, it. And, and a lot of times with Jeff is if he wasn't in the storm, he'll go, but you know, I had a friend who was uh, there and this is what he saw. And so it's always been fantastic. So thank you. And I know the weather, the weather's been quite quiet lately with the Saharan dust, at least on the Eastern side of the state. So maybe we'll see some activity this weekend, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. We need the rain. All right, yes, well, we do. Thank you very much, Jeff. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I, th I think we're going to get into the Q&A part of this, James. And I, I don't know if we're just going to get some questions that are posted to us or let me see. Uh, yeah, there's a, I, I do have some questions on the sheet. Just take a look here. I think this was a separate sheet, wasn't it, Jonathan? Okay, just... Uh, just one second. All right, just gonna go look for that. I'm gonna look through the chat to see uh, if we have anything. And oh, well, we got the soft. We have the softball questions for you. Okay. Um, what uh, what made us want to be uh, a meteorologist? Get into meteorology. What about you? Well, for me, it was surfing. I uh, became a surfer when I was in high school, and I was thinking, well, what? creates waves and well, the weather creates waves. So I wanted to know more about that and how, when I go surfing again, and I thought, hmm, this is pretty cool. I was always science minded anyways, and liked all scientific everything. So I thought well, this could be a cool career path. And that's what kind of put me into the, uh, into the weather. And you see a lot of that uh, uh, with surfers and, and boaters and any, anything that's tied to the weather um, and people, you can just, you know, they'll, they'll get the forecast, but sometimes they don't want to make their own forecast. And uh, I, I got into it probably because of hurricane. When I was 10, I was in the eye of uh, Hurricane Blanche, which was, uh, well, well, I was 10 years old. It's a long time ago. And the sun came out in the middle of the hurricane. And I didn't, at the time, didn't know anything about hurricanes. So I just thought that was fascinating that you could go through hours and hours of a storm, trees coming down, you know, roofs off, and then suddenly it gets sunny. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense. But that that, that that I think was my first kind of oh this is this could be you know something that uh, that I would be interested all my life. 
But, so that's how I get into that, which I turned out to be pretty good. Very cool. Yeah, because yeah, we're, I mean, this is, this is weather central here at Florida, South Florida, especially. Uh, I mean, we, we just get almost everything here other than the big snowstorms that we just have so many. Which we can do without. Yeah, yeah, we don't <laughs> need that. And that's the other reason we live here too, <laughs> you know. So it's, uh, it, it's exciting weather-wise, especially in the rainy season, you know, between uh, mid-May and mid-October when things just really get going here. So uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, we're all in a good place. If, if we're weather nerds, this is the place to be. All right, um, let's see. A uh, few other questions. Saharan dust fairly new or getting worse? No, I, I mean, I, we have more I, more information that we have computer models that track the dust now. Better satellites that can actually see it. Yeah, the new goes can actually see it. I will say though that was it two or three days ago when we had that? The, the, we had a day where yeah, I don't two think, days ago. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen the Saharan dust layer so significant like it was. Like you, I mean, you couldn't you couldn't see the clouds that were uh, above that, and, and a lot of the dust is you know it's. It's way up there. It's 30, 40,000 feet up in the sky. So it's above a lot of those clouds, but it was so entrained even at the surface that it was yeah. difficult to see anything at all. There's certainly no blue sky. So it, 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 it I wouldn't say it's more significant now. I, I, we certainly get big outbreaks so that we talk about it more because we have more information on it. We just, we, um, it, it's become more of, um, Kind of a weather phenomena that, that we can forecast now, where we right. you know i think 15 20 years ago everyone talked about it but it, we we wouldn't present it on the evening forecast this wasn't something that we talked about much yeah and it fluctuates too just like hurricane season from year to year you're either going to get a lot of dust or not a lot of dust and, and back and forth too and uh you know that that saharan dust is actually a fertilizer too it fertilizes everything and so it's not always a bad thing. Uh, it's good that it, well, takes care of hurricanes out there that we don't have to worry about. But, uh, you know, and there were some, I was just thinking, because I posted this on my page when Jay Cashmere did the story on the uh, sargasm seaweed, that I wonder if there's a link between the Saharan dust because it's a fertilizer and how much seaweed we had this particular year, because mm. there's been a, a ton this year and I bet there's going to be a study that may show some kind of connection. Yeah, yeah, that's true enough. Uh, another question, it seemed like more storms are formed. Well, let's, well, I mean, let's tie it to tropics, and then, because I suspect that's what the question really is. Like, you know, are there more hurricanes, tropical storms, or more frequent compared to past years? I mean, we have hit the Greek alphabet a, a few times in the last few years. Uh, a lot of the storms, you know, getting into the Greek alphabet, they don't seem to last very long. Um, we have better satellite technology now, so we can see storms that are in areas of the Atlantic that we could never see before. You know, the satellite satellites really just kind of came into play, I think, in the late '60s. So, and now you know, we have now we have these ghost satellites that just cover everything, and uh, we have we have hit the Greek alphabet. Although the Greek alphabet is now gone, but it the the other situation that arises it, when I first moved down here in the late nineties, everyone was saying, I'm glad I don't live in the Carolinas because they get all the hurricanes. It's one after another, after another. Well, then it turned into our area in 04 and 05 and even years, you know, the um, nine, 10 and into uh, 2011, 12, we were getting a lot of storms here. And now the Northern Gulf, out the Gulf, yeah, is just inundated with tropical storms and hurricanes. So it seems to have shifted a little further south. Will it come back to our area? I mean, obviously we're going to get more hurricanes and tropical storms, but it does. It it has been very busy, uh, but a lot of the storms have uh, they, they don't they don't last very long, or they're extremely powerful. Um, just some you know the Irma's and the Maria's and just. Watching them on the satellite, which is just, I mean, absolutely incredible. Really and we're still in the high, in, in the, the higher storm phase of everything too. It's, it kind of fluctuates uh, every so often where you, you get a bunch and then there's kind of a drought and then you get a bunch and there's kind of a drought. So yeah, um, yeah, definitely. So, so there's some, there was more in the chat. Okay. 
well, here's a quick one. What, what, what should we measure with the weather? Well, you know, really the base, you can get some really good weather instruments. You, know, you can get uh, obviously a thermometer. Uh, anemometer is always really good. You know, three cups that will spin around and measure the wind speed, rain gauges, and they come in all different variety. I mean, you can get just the sound, like you use just the standard tube, don't you, and measure the rain at your house and just dump it out after a big rainfall. And you can get the rain buckets with the tipping, you know, they're literally a teeter totter inside and they click and they, they measure how much rain has fallen. So, I mean, we get enormous amounts of rain here during big rain events. So, uh, you know, just, just really the, the basic stuff. And I think even, I think I saw one at Costco uh, a few weeks ago that was probably around a hundred dollars. It probably does an excellent job. So it doesn't, yeah, doesn't, I mean, you don't have to pay too much for it. It's not going to be exact like the weather service, and but right. it gives at least the general idea. I mean, it's not going to be inches off. So, yeah. I mean, gives the general idea. And even those little ones that only to hold five, six inches, I mean, they're not the greatest, but you know, it at least gives you the general idea. Right. Do you see anything on the, um so somebody asked uh, anything unusual about this summer's weather pattern and the unusual thing is usually we will fluctuate in the summer between an onshore pattern and an offshore pattern but we've had that ridge of high pressure sprawled over the entire southeast gulf coast and out to bermuda the big bermuda high and it really had, it, it really hasn't budged. Now, June, we did have the offshore pattern. When we kicked off the rainy season, it was pretty wet, but that thing has just parked itself there and has hung on for so long. Normally we can fluctuate back and forth. Finally, it looks like it's gonna break this weekend and next week. Well, I remember another year that was like that, that would be 04. So hopefully, yeah. hopefully it does. You know, it's very difficult to tell where that high is gonna be a month or two from now, but uh, that high has played a big part in Francis and Jean ending up in this area. So it, it, obviously it plays a big part in our weather here. Oh, uh, well, just, uh, we won't keep you all night. We really appreciate everyone coming in. I'll, uh, just one more question before we go and kind of wrap things up. Um, this one, how much of the forecast is dictated by your research compared to kind of like the weather service and other agencies out there? Well, now I'll say in the beginning, you know, we're, we're degree meteorologists. So we day to day do our own forecast. We come in, we take a look at the latest information. We take a look at our, we have our own rate Doppler radar here. Uh, we take a look at the computer models, which most of you can get almost the same information as far as computer yeah. models at home on your computers. And then um, we put together the forecast for the next six or seven days. Not to say, you know, I will look at other forecasts when I'm driving in, I'll hear forecasts on the radio. I kind of in the back, just kind of keep it in my memory. I'll see the, the weather surface, but we're, we're doing our own forecast. The only time that I feel like that's not the case is when a hurricane is coming. And if we, we need all the local meteorologists to be on the same page and use the National Hurricane Center forecast, their tracks, their intensities, and it's kind of tied together in tandem with not only the weather service, but the local weather office, because they're also doing hurricane bulletins at the same time. So I think that's really the only time that I feel like I don't do a lot of my own forecasting is when, and thankfully we don't have, to. it's just so much in hurricane coverage that I think we'd just be completely inundated by even trying to do that. Yeah, but day to day, it's not, it's not, yeah, but day to day, I mean, 360 days a year we're we're coming in and we're doing our own forecast here so yeah it's uh there is a lot okay there is a lot of data that comes in too and where our meteorology degrees come into play is like looking at them and interpreting all those maps because when you look at some of those maps they're crazy they have layer after layer after layer plotted on top of them you have wind barbs you have isobars you have all these kind of things different colors and all that and so we use all those day to day just to to figure out what's going on yeah and now, uh, jonathan our producer said there's a there was a, a good question maybe we'll take this as oh yeah yeah i saw that Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah, um, I would say just the storm. Well, the, the question, if you have, oh, yeah. if you didn't see it scrolling through is, uh, would you like, uh, you know, daily or even hourly weather data like, uh, Brian, who I believe is on the chat updates that to, or uploads that to weather underground, you know, anyone with a personal weather station with a little bit of, uh, knowledge can, you know, post their 
their reports, post their weather center data to that website. Uh, we're not looking for that so much because there are so many, there's, there's access to so many sensors now, but we really want is the, the videos and photos and your actual visually what you're seeing out there. That's right. key for us because we will use that. I want to see the action. Yes. What's and, going on. And we'll pass it along to the weather service and then they'll determine whether new warnings or, uh, you know, uh, warnings are issued for areas. It could be a severe thunderstorm warning, it could be a tornado warning. I mean, if one of you call, if, if let's say there's a tornado, um, risk of tornadoes, and one of you sends in clearly a photo of a tornado or a video, they're likely going to issue a tornado warning because of that. Um, especially if the radar is indicating something significant at the same time. So that's, you'll be more invaluable because you're on the ground in those areas at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And it's not necessarily the bad stuff either. Hey, we want the sunset pictures. Yeah. We want the beach pictures, something unusual that you may see, even if it's not even weather related, like a, a turtle or, or just something unusual out there. We want to see that too. So we want to be, uh, we want you to be our spotters for like anything that's crazy out there that we could show everybody and at least share with the entire community. All right. So uh, I think we're going to wrap it up now. Just a reminder, we're going to, uh, I don't know how many of these we have right now. I, this may be a product. I don't even know if you've seen this. I have. It, it's, uh, it's a car magnet. And uh, I know we'll be sending those out, uh, depending on how many we get to in the next uh, week or two. And you'll be hearing, of course, from uh, us on uh, the reporting. And, you know, be safe out there. And uh, just be careful when you're, especially during severe weather events. And uh, be cautious. But at the same time, we'd love to get your information and get your photos and your videos. For sure, we would love to see that and to, and to get it in a timely manner. Like you guys are out there, charged, ready to go. We appreciate it. Yeah. So thank you everyone and have yourself a great evening and uh, have a great weekend too, or Friday and the weekend. Uh, thanks so much thank for joining, we really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. thank you guys.